Tonight's special guest is Ian Wishart, author and founder of Investigate Magazine. Ian is here tonight to tell us about his number one selling book called Aircon. We welcome Ian Wishart as our special guest on The Beat Goes On. Ian Wishart, welcome to The Beat Goes On. Thanks very much. My gosh, you create a lot of beat in your life, don't you? Ah, well, you get a name for it after a while. Yeah. You've just scraped in in the baby boom, of, according to the Americans. Yeah, I'm always uh, fascinated by the fact I miss out on one measuring and, and not <laughs> on the other sort of thing. And sometimes, yeah, I suppose it's the schizophrenic nature of us junior baby boomers. You were born in 1964. 64. Now, whereabouts, uh, Ian? Uh, Whangarei. Our parents were working all over the country um, for what's now telecom, but was the, the old post office and so forth. So they were transferred up there and then down to Auckland and down to all over the place. So I just happened to be born up in Whangarei. Yeah. And you went to school there? And no, 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 I went to school in uh, Wellington and uh, Dunedin and elsewhere, so yeah. I've been all over the place, lived all over the country. Now even as a child, were you looking around you thinking, that's not right, I'd like to do something about that? Did, did that I, we had a, a family culture which was always, you know, uh, very much watch the news at uh, six o'clock at night and see what's happening in the world. And um, I became very aware of, of things like the Vietnam War and, and other things that were happening around me at the time. Uh, you know, when Porritt was Governor General in the, the late 60s, I was conscious of that. Uh, so um, I guess I'd always had that affinity for news and current affairs and, uh, uh, and, and that sort of thing. So it, it became a sort of natural flow on to move into that. But then you had the greatest of all courageous steps. You said, I'm going to have my own magazine. That was, <laughs> that's a piggy, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, there's been a few courageous steps. I mean, the, uh, um, Investigate, I guess, was a natural progression as well because we already had a publishing company doing books and mm. uh, we had a lot of people coming to us with manuscripts saying, can you publish my book? And we mm. had hundreds of them sitting on the desks. Mm. And a lot of those books, uh, whilst they're good and interesting stories... Um, weren't you, strong enough to be... Well, uh, they, they weren't strong enough... On their own, yeah, they weren't strong yeah. enough to stand on their own mm. and as a $30 book that someone's got to mm. go out there and put hard-earned cash, cash on the table yeah. and take away. The story simply was too long, too involved, too complex, too hard to tell. Um, yet the story could be crystallised down, distilled down to a good magazine story. So we thought to ourselves, well, we've got a lot of material here. We should actually look at doing a magazine. Metro, we felt, had lost its way at that stage. It had been a bastion of uh, investigative journalism. It had become a sort of a gossip magazine in, in uh, 2000, 1999. Um, and we saw a niche in the market, so we created Investigate. You've done a wonderful job, haven't you? Because, I mean, you've stirred the hornet's nest, haven't you? And, um... It is the <laughs> most talked about news and current affairs magazine in New Zealand for the last 10 years. Um, you know, barely a month goes by without somebody somewhere referring to something that investigates yeah. doing or has done. So you must be proud of that. Yeah, I guess it gets lost in the noise. I mean, we're so busy that uh, it's it, there's obviously satisfaction when you cover a major story and, and you bring something to the public's attention that they weren't aware of and you're able to create debate. And one of the things Investigate's good at is because there's so many media outlets uh, catering to the, the status quo, the establishment view, if you like, mm -hmm. um, we like to come in under the radar and offer the alternative viewpoint that other people are not yep. covering because they just don't see it. Uh, and regardless of you know whether we necessarily agree with it, we think it's important for that, that viewpoint to be heard. Now all this time you've been bringing out some marvellous books like The Paradise Conspiracy, Number One, um, Ben and Olivia, and this year's It's a Beauty. <laughs> <laughs> and it's number one, isn't it? Yeah, it went to number one here in New Zealand. Yeah. It uh, went to number one on Amazon in the UK and the US on their uh, climate change list. Um, it's still uh, a top five bestseller on the British Amazon uh, list. Uh, for climate, and uh, we're out selling Al Gore over there, so you know we're very pleased about that. <laughs> Unbelievable title: the uh, the seriously un inconvenient truth about global warming. Now, what's the pathway to uh, putting pen to paper and writing this book? Well, and I had been initially a believer in global warming back in the late eighties when it first raised its head. Mm -hmm. It seemed like a viable Good theory, didn't it? It seemed like a yeah. workable theory on, on paper and so forth. And the, they were very cautious about it in those days. They were going to do more scientific research, etc. And they proceeded to do that, and, and the more they did, the more it seemed to be that this was a viable scenario. However, I guess over the last sort of five or six years, um, my radar, my antennae have yeah. been sort of twitching, and I was thinking, hmm, I'm a journalist who used to work in PR for the government. Mm. I understand a PR campaign when this I can see it. This sounds like PR. This is getting away from science and into mm. propaganda. Why yeah. is it becoming propaganda? Yes, yes. Um, what's behind this, and, and can we rely on what they're saying? 
Uh, so I began to research the background of, of global warming and whether in fact climate change was happening, point number one, and if it was, is it caused by humans, point number two, because I'm not a climate change denier. Mm. The climate has always changed. Yes, it's always uh, changing. And, and you get hot periods, you get cold periods, and sometimes those hot periods can last hundreds of years, and cold periods likewise. Climate change and warming has taken place, but if it's not caused by humans, then no amount of us paying 45 trillion US dollars in tax is going to make a blind make bit of difference, difference to it. Yeah. It'll cripple the world's economy, but you won't get a single benefit from it. Um, and that's the key point that hasn't really been sort of mm. brought to the fore in the debate mm. even now. It's, it's missing. And the question is, why are they so alarmist? Why are they so shrill? Words like catastrophic um, will be dry. You know, it's such alarmist language. Yeah. Why? What? Again, that was a, a part of the propaganda thing that set me off. Um, they were using what we call lizard brain phrases designed to get a knee-jerk reaction yes. in the subconscious before the person even is aware of the fact <laughs> they're being played to. Um, and uh, yes. it's, it is, it's a, it's a very instinctive mm. sort of gut reaction, mm. you know. Type language. Uh, type language. That, that islands will be, uh, uh, in the submerged Pacific will be submerged. And, and all yeah, that all of the stuff, rest yeah. of the sort of stuff. And, and we'll be starving. And, yep, uh, yep. Yeah. And, and vast areas of, of land will be flooded and every yeah. hurricane you see is linked to global warming and, and what have you. And the why of it, I mean, in Aircon, the first part of the book, uh, the first, I suppose, three quarters of the book, deals with the science of global warming. Is it happening? If it's happening, is it caused by humans or are there natural reasons? And my verdict in looking at the science is overwhelmingly it's caused by natural phenomena, uh, which we can't do much about. Mm. And if we're going to put money into global warming research, we should be putting it to adaptation for you know adapting to what's around the corner rather than sitting here worrying about trying to reduce carbon emissions because it ain't going to make a blind bit of difference. The last quarter of the book, however, looks at the agenda, and I was fascinated by what's behind this. I mean, you mm. raised the issue of, of the shrill mm. nature of what's being said and so forth, and so many people jumping on the bandwagon from all yes. different sectors. Fascinating. There's, there's some, something behind it, isn't Follow there? Follow the money. Follow the money. Follow the money. I mean, yeah. there, there's several aspects to it. You have this perfect storm of uh, groups of people, vested interests, um, mm. who are looking for things. You have, on the one hand, a world economic collapse in a, in a bubble that's been a long time waiting to burst, uh, and the financiers and so forth looking for a new bubble. And mm. they know that carbon trading is, is, is the, the future in this regard because think of it this way. Um, there are gold markets, but you're not personally forced to buy or sell gold. No. Um, there are oil markets, and yes, we use the petrol, but you're not really forced to buy or sell oil and so forth. You can uh, use a bicycle, use a bicycle <laughs> or, or do something else. Yeah. But uh, carbon markets will be, if they're brought in compulsory and worldwide, every single person in the world will not be able to buy or sell without working mm. through the carbon market. Um, and whoever controls the carbon markets is going to become squillionaires yeah. and in control of the planet. Yeah. So there is an enormous amount at stake for the, the financiers and the business elite and so forth, the, the really super huge global entities. And, and that's why the oil companies are jumping on board yeah. with this, because they can see that if they can get involved in this market, they can make some money when the oil runs out. Um, then you have the uh, earnest, well-meaning, uh, die-hard liberal types, I call them, who uh, have who, followed. Do you think are being used in this Well, whole, yeah, they are. Yeah, they, they, yeah. They're what Lenin used to call the useful idiots. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they they have they genuinely believe mm. because they've been told by all these shrill mm. people that the planet is heating up and it's caused by humans that the world's going to hell in a handcart and uh, humans are to blame and we must do something yesterday to fix this uh, and they're genuine in their belief and I and I admire them for that but mm. they're wrong then yeah. you get the more cynical liberals mm. uh, who I guess have long um, dallied with and particularly the baby boomer ones. Uh, the ideas of Marx and so forth and, and socialism and how to better redistribute wealth across the planet in a more fair and equitable manner. Yeah. And of course there's good arguments for doing yeah, things like exactly. that. But this is being done by stealth and what they've realised is that if they can unite the world behind a common cause and they can convince the world to submit themselves to new laws in that common cause and agree to an international treaty that controls every country on the, on the planet and there's part of that treaty that they can set up a new tax system that taxes every single citizen of the world, left, right and centre, and puts money into a kitty for the new cynical liberals to control, then they will have political control of the planet. 